Hello and welcome to today's event, Microsoft Teams, Risks and Solutions for Undergoverned Systems. Today's event is being recorded on behalf of Intellinet. If you do not consent to being part of a recorded session, please disconnect your line at this time. The recording will be available at the same location you joined today's event. To learn more about the ways you can participate in today's event, please click on the messages button in the lower left-hand corner of your screen. Feel free to let us know if you are ready to get started by typing in a message and selecting send. We encourage you to interact by using the messages panel at any time to ask questions regarding content or to request support. We will do our best to answer all of your questions, but due to time constraints, we might be unable to answer all of them during the live event. Your feedback is important, so please take a few minutes to complete a survey that will appear at the end of the event. Thank you in advance for your support. If you experience any technical difficulties, refresh your browser by pressing Control F5 or the Refresh Now button on the information panel. If this does not resolve the issue, please send in a message and we will be happy to assist. There is also an online test page if you wish to self-support. Simply click the Help button in the Information tab. Now, I'd like to introduce your host, Charlie DeLong. Vice President of Modern Workplace at IntelliNet. Charlie, you have the floor. Thank you very much, Sage, and thank you all for uh, joining us today. Today's webinar is put on in partnership between AvPoint and IntelliNet. As Sage mentioned, today we'll be talking about Microsoft Teams, risks and solutions for an undergoverned solutions. So today's speakers are going to be uh, Tim from AvPoint, who's a SVP of their client services, and then we also have Steve, from Intellinet, who is the VP of Digital Architecture. So, without uh, further ado, let's start the uh, let's start the conversation. So, Tim and Steve, thank you for uh, making the time and joining us today. And uh, let's start this off, Tim, with a question for you. What does governance oh. mean for you? Thanks, Charlie. I mean, that's a a big question, right? Because governance is a big word. You can be talking about corporate governance or IT governance. Governance, but in this context and what we're talking about today, to really it means uh, a focus on unstructured content. You know, so we think about all the content we have in our organization. Uh, we have relational content in databases, all this other stuff. But when it comes to collaborative productivity solutions like Microsoft Teams and SharePoint, we have a lot of information floating around in different documents, in different chats, in different spaces, all over the place. So for me. Governance is about having a strategy about how do we manage and control that information. You know, if there's questions around. You know, uh, if we have a strategy around how do we want to control the security of that? How do we want to know who's accessing it? The question is, what is the plan that we have in place? How do we know what our rules are? How are we implementing it? What are the people, processes and technology that we have in place to keep a handle on that information? And really, that's that's what we want to be talking about today. What about yeah, you, Steve? Yeah. I agree. Uh, you know, just to add on to that is uh, just say, you know, it's definitely about control, right? Governance is about yeah. control and defining the rules and, and not just what the rules are, but enforcing those rules. But it's also, you know, it's not just an IT or a technology thing, right? It's a, it's a business thing and a process thing. The business needs to be involved to make sure that IT is aligned with them so they can enforce the right rules with the right tools. Um, you know, IT does need control, but the business needs to find those 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 uh, requirements, right? Is there compliance uh, requirements that the business needs to to uh, adhere to, but technology also needs to adhere to? Um, guest access, information protection, all those things go into that, right? We're going to have repeatable process. I think one of the most important things to defining a good government's governance plan is that you can define and identify and define, you know, repeatable process in the business, especially in a mm -hmm. Teams and a SharePoint environment, right? Uh, otherwise, that sprawl becomes just complete chaos. Um, you know, if we have 100 project teams that have the same structure with the same, you know, format, that's, that's good. That's not sprawl. But if we have 100 teams that have just random channels and you know, bare, barely any usage and files all in different folders and channels, and then that's not a good process, right? So yeah, and I, I think you mentioned you, you, there was sort of two sides to the coin. You said having the business policy or the business process, but then also enforcing it. And and one of the things we like to say here at our point is, you know, if you've got a policy and you're not enforcing it, it's really just a suggestion, not a policy. So exactly. <laughs> if you've got these business rules, you know, what are you doing to actually control them and make sure that they're being implemented? Yeah, it reminds me of the days we, we used to write, you know, Charlie, we've written many governance plans, 80 page documents that nobody ever probably read <laughs> for SharePoint <laughs> governance, right? You definitely need the tool in place. And that's that's what where AppPoint really, really shines right there. 
Awesome, guys. So, so thanks for that. So now that we kind of have an understanding of what governance means to you guys, and, you know, we all want to make sure we don't have that sprawl, but do you guys have a client example that you could share with us of someone who is struggling for governance and maybe some of the things that uh, that you did to help that those clients? Yeah, I, I can go first, Tim, if you want. Yeah, I, sure. There's a couple of things come to mind. We have a lot of CIOs come to us, you know, basically can't can't sleep at night because they have an uh, un, unknown number of teams out there with external guests sharing God knows what of their, you know, private or, you know, uh, information that should not be out on the Internet. I've heard stories of uh, one client, I think, had a, a region in Japan that they merged with. Um, and over the course of four or five months, they had 19,000 teams created. I don't, even, I don't know if you could even do that, you know, if you tried, but they, they did. Um, you know, then, you know, names just common, you know, same name or similar name for uh, three or four times on many teams that, you know, are for different purposes, you know, whether it's uh, by company name or department or whatnot. So uh, lots of messes can be created without without a proper governance plan, for sure. And I'm sure, Tim, you see that in your travels constantly. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, people typically don't come to us when everything's fine, right? They normally <laughs> come with right. uh, exactly. some sort of thing that they're, some sort of challenge that they're looking to solve. So exactly like you said, you know, especially at the beginning of the pandemic, we saw a great uptick in the adoption of Teams as everybody started working from home, which is fantastic for collaboration and productivity, but we also saw lots of teams getting created and abandoned. And so it was very easy to, like, like you said, you had that customer with 19,000 teams suddenly created. Uh, that's not an unusual situation. And then the, the governance question around that is, what are these teams? Who do they belong to? Who do I go and speak to about them? You know, do we need to keep them? And these are all, all governance related. And in fact, one of the things you mentioned about the naming just reminded me of a story as well. One of our customers uh, is a global customer headquartered in the EU and they had you know, similar proliferation of teams going everywhere and they didn't have any rules or control over who can create them or what they're called. And like you said, you, know, you mentioned there about when things are named uh, in the same way, that it causes confusion. One of the one of the regional sites uh, in Asia actually created an HR site and they just called it Human Resources. <laughs> and remember the companies <laughs> located in the EU and everybody thought it was the global HR site and they started putting all information in there that really wasn't supposed to be shared outside of EU boundaries, <laughs> including you know PII, GDPR kind of implications. And, and that was all down to the fact that they didn't have any control over who's creating it and what it's being called yeah. or any restrictions so those, over the naming. Yeah. So those situations not only <laughs> not only can control, you know, can cause sprawl in those cases, but those can be some serious fines <laughs> from yeah. GDPR perspective, right? And then right. you had said you had mentioned something that you know abandoned teams and and the I think the stat statistics out of those nineteen thousand teams, there were like five hundred teams that had more than one file in it. So li people were literally creating a team to collaborate on one file, right? And and there were no conversations in the chat. So not the quite the right usage and and that's that goes a little beyond governance right that goes into guidance like people need guidance governance is also sort of a guidance plan as well right how do you use teams and why did you use teams um what, actually what that's scenarios that, that that's all related so you know when it comes to uh, obviously one of the AppPoint solutions is about automating things like the provisioning questionnaires and, and the life cycle management but one of our stances is if you make it easy to do the right thing then it's more likely that uh, people will adopt it in the right ways so it, rather than just an empty button that says oh create whatever you want you know if you have a guided questionnaire about what is this for who's in the team you know yeah. uh, and those kinds of qualifying business questions to guide people to the right thing to do eliminate that ambiguity for sure so, yeah so that that's a great segue guys into you know how are you seeing repeatable processes work in teams right where are you seeing success in there and can you can you kind of explain that journey a little bit for us sure so I'll, i think one of the most important things there is is um you know working with the business again to define and I identify and then define those repeatable processes, right? And I think the most important, one of the most important decisions is defining what is a team in, in a given situation. Some companies, a team, you know, if you're a project-based company, a team might be a project, but it also could be a client and a channel is a project. And if you don't make those recommendations to your project teams, they're going to do those two ways and probably come up with 10 other different ways to use a team and channels within them, right? And you'll get that incredibly 
you know, messy inconsistency across all of your project teams. Not to mention people will also find the same, you know, way to mess up department teams and sales and RFP teams and all of those things. So the, the key is defining what is a team? What's the paradigm of a team? Is it a client? Is it a project? Is it a region? Is it a department? Is it an RFP or all of the above? And, and give your company templates for that. And then going even deeper into that, which apps are you going to allow in your teams? Which files and folder structures should be defaulted in given channels in, in a given type of team and a project team and an RFP team? So, you know, you might have a engineering channel in your project team. You might have a um, marketing channel in your project team. You might have a legal channel in your project team. And there might be file structures within. Define all these. Help your audience understand how to use teams better one note notebook as well planner templates as well there's there's so many ways that you can help uh your organization understand the office 365 tools and how they fit into that team paradigm yeah and and the thing the biggest challenge there is actually defining it so yeah. all the questions that you just raised are, are perfect but it's going to be different from customer to customer so you know a lot of organizations have informal processes, right? They know, oh, I can create a team and then something's gonna happen. Or, oh, I know I can go to help desk and ask them and they'll create a team for me. Part of creating a repeatable process is actually defining that, you know, answering those questions. If you think of IT as a service, what's the service definition for this team? So, you know, what do we mean by a team? What are the apps and channels that are gonna be available for it? Who can request it? How long does it live for? You know, these are the standard questions that once we have an answer for them, we've now defined the process and now we can make that repeatable. So, you know, it's not just about the template itself, the, the you know, the, the specific channels and apps in there is, is, is definitely a big part of that, but it's also the other questions around it as well. And um, typically when we get started on that journey, you know, one of the recommendations we have for, for making that process repeatable is, you know, don't boil the ocean on your first go. Pick right. one team or one example, like Steve was saying, like an RFP team or a project team. Projects are usually a good example because, you know, ad hoc membership, start date, end date has a very defined life cycle and usually a fixed template, you know, with your kickoff and your requirements and documentation, all that sort of stuff. Start with one example and flesh that out to what that looks like as a repeatable process and then apply that same process to your other examples of teams. It, that's a good point. We, yeah. we do we do a lot of teamwork workshops, we call them, in the, of various sizes. Yeah. A three-hour teamwork workshop with, you know, a handful of project managers would do, can do wonders, right? But in other companies, it might be, you know, a series of three-hour workshops over the course of three months to define a bigger, you know, uh, manufacturing, you know, process, for example, um, new product development processes. We've done all different types of, of processes like that. Um, but, uh, you know, it's not rocket science. It's not even technical. It's uh, about, you know, fostering and facilitating that conversation with the right people who understand the business process and need to use those tools and to become more productive with those tools. Um, they'll use them in so many ways you'll never imagine if you don't foster those conversations, right? And most of the ways will cause you headaches. Um, again, you'll, you know, this, that's when the CIOs call us, and I'm sure, you know, AvPoint is right in the front of that when, you know, uh, I have, you know, proprietary information all over the place in teams, and all these teams have guests in them. I have no idea where my information is. And we say, well, we better start talking about governance and may maybe need to start talking about you know, information protection, and that's part of that governance plan, and, and so on and so forth. So, you, so you can sleep at night moving forward. Yeah. I, I also, oh, oh, just before you go on, Charlie. So, one other yeah. thing about that is, uh, one rabbit hole we see um, customers sometimes fall into is they try and create a template for every single you know department in the organization, right. and th that takes a lot of maturity to get to that point. So, you might have five different departments all running projects. Start with the commonalities, you know, you can create the overall framework, but then allow the business users to, uh, you know, adapt that once they've provisioned it and work within it the way they see fit. You don't have to have, uh, you don't have to let the business dictate the, the minute details of every single template, otherwise you're going to be drowning in templates. So yeah, absolutely. Think about the, yeah. Sorry, I just cut you off. I thought you were done. But <laughs> once, you, once you give them that, once you give them, get them started, you know, you yeah. point them in the right direction, give them a pat on the butt. Then they then they understand the meaning of teams, the meaning of channels, the yes. meaning of how, how to how to collaborate, and they'll come up with more sophisticated but hopefully proper ways because now they've they've got the knowledge and they've been you know they're aware. The awareness is so important. It's not even training. It's it's just awareness. Exactly. Awesome. So, 
Um, speaking of awareness, now you guys have given me a challenge. I want to write a script to see if I can get 19,000 teams before we get throttled in uh, Office 365. <laughs> but um, but in, in that vein, you know, is there a good way to control or manage the creation of teams across the org? You know, what are you guys seeing? What are those best practices that people here can take back to their to their organization and start to implement so that they can they can have you know that that uh, properly governed uh, system. So I'll, I'll take this one first, Charlie. So just sure. simply because you said you know we can write a script to provision those teams, you don't have to. Okay, so uh, you know without going too far down the line, you know obviously one of um, our point's key products is the cloud governance tool, SaaS tool connects to your tenant and it has all of these steps uh, automated already. It's an off the shelf. So you don't have to spend time writing your own PowerShell, writing your own Power Apps if you don't want to. So um, when you talk about, is there a good way to control, uh, manage the creation of teams across the org? Absolutely. So one of those automated steps that you should do, whether it's with the AvPoint tool or something else, is making sure you're taking control of that creation process and asking the users the right kinds of questions that you need to capture rather than just a free for all button. And Steve will talk a, a bit more about that in a sec. but. Um, certainly from our side, from the AvPoint side, one of the key takeaways we want to uh, have the audience take away is in addition to just the creation, think about the lifecycle management as well, right? You don't want to be in that position where you've got 19,000 teams that were automatically provisioned and created through a, through a cool process. You want to be able to capture what are they for, how long do they need them, do we need to go through a renewal process to ask the owner, do you still need this site, and then what happens to it afterwards? So. Uh, yeah, we're big proponents of, of auto provisioning and auto management. You know, we like to take that burden off the IT teams. We don't want the support desk having to manually keep an Excel spreadsheet of, of you know, every single site and who the owner is and, and follow up with them as part of a corporate process. You know, you can really automate a lot of that. Yeah, and that, that's well said, Tim. I mean, the AppPoint tools are just world class when it comes to managing uh, that process. It reminds me, we, we did a, we do a lot of projects together, obviously, but, uh, one of the, one of the projects, one of my favorite projects that uh, our team did was, uh, for a, uh, a design team, uh, very large 1500 man design person design team. Um, and I think at the end of the, you know, then in a six week, uh, works, you know, six week engagement, we did, I don't know, eight or 10 workshops and we came out with 12 or 13 different project types and therefore 12 or 13 different templates. And we then were able to work with that point and implement that provisioning process. So um, the, the client in this particular case was very, uh, the IT team was very, uh, how do I say, rigid in their, in their approach. They were really, really locking things down. Um, yep. And so I think, I, I agree with that philosophy, right? I don't like teams to be wide open. So anybody and everybody can create a team. I know that ultimately that can be your goal, but I think early on, if people aren't, you know, uh, aware of why a team should exist and, and how and when it should exist, you should sort of limit that. You know, you, you don't want them to shoot themselves in the foot. So lock it down, I think, is, is the one of the things that I would recommend in that, in that case in terms of how to manage it. Um, I think Microsoft would like tend to disagree with me sometimes because they, they want it to, to, to proliferate. They think it's, um, you know, beneficial to that. And I guess there's two sides of that coin. Uh, but I would go from a governance perspective, lock it down, define your patterns, right? Define those templates. Um, and then you can, I like how you can take a template and sort of the, the approach of taking a template, project template, for example, assign project managers to templates that they can, request a, a provision of a new template for a new project, right? Or a sales manager can request the provisioning of a new RFP team, for example. Um, and you, you know, you define templates which go with a process and you assign people to those templates and they're the people that can request that template, right? Now there's also lots of ad hoc need, right? Not everything is a structured project or a structured RFP process um, or a department team. So there's lots of ad hoc teams that have the right time and a place. And so there's ways to manage that, you know, basically empty templates that directors or department heads or, you know, certain people who understand when and why to provision a team are allowed to provision a team on behalf of somebody else. Um, so it seems a, maybe that seems a little bit too strict, uh, but I think up front, you're better off erring on that side than it's really hard to catch up in this game. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Once, once the horse is out of the barn, man, it's, 
it's a pretty big effort to pull it back in because you can pull it back in and lock it down, but you but you can't really change that content that already uh, mm. sprawled out there. You know, people are collaborating on whatever they're collaborating on, and you can't go moving their cheese all around just to just to adhere to a new policy you just came up with. It's gonna it's gonna mess everybody up. It's gonna mess their OneNote notebook syncs. It's gonna mess up the links they've shared with everybody. You can't just go go sort of do that, right? So to find the auto provisioning process and you're the the key, another big point that you mentioned was the life cycle, right? You know, you yeah. don't want projects hanging out there forever. If a project's over, what do you do? Do you archive it and kill the team? Do you, um, you know, there's so many different ways to handle that. Um, but that's that's a key key uh, component as well um, to the whole provisioning process and, and the creation uh, management. Yeah, and yeah. just on the flip side of that, just to, uh, talk a little bit more about, you know, you mentioned locking down or, or, you know, restricting the creation process until there's a process underway. I mean, the reason we err on the side of caution for that and we prefer it uh, going in that direction is, is, like Steve said, you know, if you end up with a proliferation of teams, the best practices for managing those teams actually haven't changed since back in the SharePoint days, right? Yeah, what is exactly. the site? What is the team? Who is the owner? What is it for? So if you've got a lot of, if you've got 19,000 teams out there, you can, like, even without any automation tools or anything, you can go through that process of having your Excel spreadsheet or having your list or library saying, here is the site, here is the owner, here's what it's for, here's what we need to, uh, you know, here's, here's what we need to do with it from a business perspective and here's the archiving process. You can do that, but uh, as Steve said, once that horse is bolted out of the barn, it's going to be a lot of work for someone every day to just come in. And we have seen this with customers who do adopt a create and chase strategy, but it's, you know, someone's... Uh, job description is basically come in in the morning look at all the sites that have been created and start chasing up what does it belong to and what's the governance policies we have to apply to it so it's possible and there's scenarios where that happens and definitely as you get automation that will improve things however uh you know starting up front by being able to control it up front and ask those questions up front will save you a lot of work down the line later so it's not yeah. impossible but it is preferred <laughs> and i think a lot of people have gotten into that sort of predicament over the last few covid months right because they were taking a, I, we saw a lot of clients taking that slow approach and then boom all of a sudden they had to get teams out and they didn't have time to really lock it down and govern it and so a lot of them are playing catch up in that area i mean we've done we do a lot of um tenant to tenant and office 365 tenant consolidations and you know again same similar to what you said abandoned teams are just rampant everywhere right in those types of scenarios the hard part there and this is why i caution to get a handle sooner than later. The hard part is it's not just a compliance or a governance, um, you know, and a process definition uh, exercise after the fact. After the fact, you have to get the end users and the business and the end users involved because you don't know what's what you're moving and you can't just go move things around. If you do, you're going to uh, you're going to get a lot of angry people. Um, running you down, right? And and that that uh, that's going to be executives as well as you know uh, frontline people, right? And anywhere in between. So that can be a big big problem to rein in. We we do it all the time. It's it is recoverable, um, yep. but uh, but it's it's a challenge that's uh, you can you can avoid with proper planning. Um, so um, awesome guys, that, that's great. Thank you very much for that. And so. Now, you know, what kind of advice can you give an IT director or a leader in the IT organization who's struggling with managing this team's journey at their enterprise, right? You know, this was thrown on to a lot of us, you know, with COVID and with the need to extend our collaboration, right? But what are some, again, what are some things we can take back to, uh, to our organizations after this to start helping with that and help, helping uh, understand where we are? Tim, you want to give this one a shot first? Yeah, I, my first question will be is, you know, identify what your struggle is, right? So we do get customers that are coming to us asking, oh, we're having a, a challenge with Teams or we're having a, having a struggle. And, and the first question we ask, well, is it sprawl? Is it adoption? And I, I saw we had a poll earlier talking about things like security control and, and external sharing. So, you know, the advice back... Uh, back to the IT director who's saying, hey, we're having a problem with security control and sprawl, I would say, what rules are you trying to do, right? Are you trying to say, we want to be uh, you know, auditable or we want to know 
who's in what team or we're having an issue with, we only want to restrict external sharing to certain sites. Okay, that's fine. The technology is there to do that, to be able to configure the sites, but it's the process that you need to sort out. So um, probably the number one thing I'd say is look, identify what your struggle is first and then start honing in on, on what the rules are around it. Yeah, and then I would just add some of the things we kind of already talked about to that. I think um, the first thing I would I recommend to folks is, is usually to lock it down, lock down who can create teams until you're ready to let people create teams and you know who who is responsible enough and capable enough to create teams. Remember the old governance, SharePoint governance plans where uh, I know a lot of clients used to, you had to take a certain amount of training to be able to <laughs> become a site collection admin, right? And that yep. was like, you don't hear any of that anymore. It's, it's now it's like, it's more about, hey, this is easy to use and let's enable the end user, which is great um, until it's not, right? <laughs> and, uh, I think teams naming conventions is one thing that's greatly overlooked. Um, so, you know, allowing someone to create an HR uh, yeah. team, probably not a great idea, or, or a finance team or a marketing team, like that should really be restricted and you can you can restrict names and, and keywords in in the Office 365 platform for teams as well as groups. So that's one thing, you know, and establish a naming convention uh, format. We, we kind of recommend it depending on the client, like maybe something like department dot year dot team name, right? And you can use tools like AppPoint or um, other tools that uh, we we developed some tools as well um, with provisioning processes that can tag team prefixes and prefix suffix or suffixes onto a team name when a team is requested or a team is created. Um, one, one killer is, is duplicative team names or similar team names. Um, and there's, you know, there's no way out of the box to stop someone creating a team called ABC and then another team called ABC comma Inc and another team called alpha beta zeta, whatever the C would be. And, in Greek letters, um, and and that that's a huge problem. And all those teams theoretically are created for the same reason by people who didn't know somebody else created the other team first. There's ways to resolve that. That's one of the um, values of an approval process. Ex exactly, approval process. Um, and then the I think deciding whether your teams are going to allow external users is a huge. Uh, huge pivot point, I'll say, in your team's journey. Um, lock that down until you're ready to have external users access your content. Because if you don't, they will be there. And it, again, once those once they're in, it's hard to get them out. Um, yep. it's, like, it's like you're having a big party. Once, <laughs> once they're there, you can't, can't throw them out. Actually, um, actually, on that, that's that's one of the other pieces of advice we give to to customers who are struggling with with something, right? On on the M three six five platform, you know, taking it back a step, one of the early questions we ask right up front when it comes to defining the governance and the processes is, what is your goal for this platform? You know, we have some people who are deploying M three six five to retire legacy systems. We have some that are doing for uh, you know improved collaboration. We have some that are trying to solve a problem with searching for documents. If your issue, if, if your goal for M365 is we want to collaborate better with external parties, you know, get rid of shadow IT, stop move, stop people moving into, you know, WhatsApp or other chat applications that we can't control and, you know, we want to control it. That's a really great driver to be able to align everybody in your team in terms of, you know, when you've got a governance committee, which we'll talk about a bit later, but, you know, aligning all the different players from your security and the other things to say, hey, one of our goals is improving external sharing. What do we need to do to make this happen safely? Do we need to request it? Do we need to know where they are? You know, what are the things that we need? And then you can put those processes in place. I, and I can't agree with you more there, Tim. I think external sharing is one of the most valuable yeah. uh, features that that teams brings to an organization, right? How many how many projects, how many, how many collaboration scenarios can you think of that don't include people external to your company, right? It's, it's very, very rare. Maybe internal department collaboration and that's it, right? Every project, every sale that I work on, every um, you know, every cross-department functional solution almost always brings in a vendor, a partner, a consultant that somebody's you know hired on the side. There's always external collaboration. You need to think about that. If you don't include that into your collaboration plan, you know I always say that's a cop out, and and you can do better because if you don't, your users will figure out a way to do it. Maybe it won't be in yep. Teams, but it'll be in Google Drive or, you know, in, in Box or whatever, and they'll, they'll get it done. 
Um, and so putting, again, whether it's Azure Information Protection in place or, or whatever you, you know, whatever you deem the appropriate tool to lock things down and make you able to sleep, able to sleep at night is critical. But, but you've got to allow your end users external guest access at the right time with the right, yes. with the right uh, precautions in place. It's like that Jeff Goldblum in Jurassic Park, you know, life finds a way. So it's, it's the same kind of thing. You know? If your users exactly. want to get it done, they're going to find a way. And it's the question yeah. is, do you want it on your platform? You go the or... chaos way. <laughs> it's the recommended way that, that you can control, right? So for sure. So, so, so in, in that vein, guys, you know, we've never been in an environment where, you know, security and compliance is more important. How do we integrate, you know, that that business compliance into the process and make sure that we are aligned with our, our CSOs as part of this. Well, I'll jump on that quick. The, our, one of the things we do um, all the time is, I said earlier, teamwork workshops. One of the most important segments or one of the most important pillars to those engagements, um, and they could be, like I said, they could be a couple days in total or several months in total, depending on the situation. But one of the most important things we do is we align the business with IT. Yep. Um, and, and we do it as early as possible now. We've learned through repeating this. We didn't do that that early in the, in the, you know, in the early stages here. And we would talk to the business because that's you know, where all the strategy, that's where the most important stuff happens, right? And then we bring that to IT and they say, well, wait a minute. We do not allow any external guests and teams at this point. Well, that just blew the last month of work we did with your business. So um, get that alignment early. And that's when you, you bring the CISOs in, um, you bring the IT admins in, the IT directors in, and the business leads in. And you make sure that everybody's on the same page because the goals of, you know, whatever, the claims department at insurance company XYZ is to get customers involved in, in a, you know, a customer type of uh, um, support scenario in teams. Well, IT, you know, IT can squash that quickly if they're not allowing guests, right? Um, or they don't allow people's names to be used in conversations and chat or whatever, right? Or the chat doesn't last for more than, we had one, one situation where chats were not allowed to for last for more than a week, I think it was, because they were they were so afraid of legal compliance issues they had but email can sit there for months right but chats can't mm. last more than a week they would archive them like it was they want that's what they want to do so it was it's really important to get that that discussion started up front and if you don't you could really paint yourself into a corner quickly yep exactly so yeah, I, I agree with you on that getting them involved early getting them involved often uh, and part of, one of the things that we haven't quite touched on yet is the idea of a governance committee. Yeah. And, um, you know, our recommendation to that is it's a good one, good idea to have one. Uh, but I think sometimes customers and, and clients get caught up a bit too much in the formality of the committee, you know, bringing it back to its roots. At the end of the day, IT is going to be responsible for creating and maintaining these services in teams, whether it's a project site or an RFP site, and these creation and external sharing settings that need to be configured what the governance committee is really the, the the meeting of minds the key players that need to come together and think about is, hey someone's requested from the business that we want external sharing on who do we need to help have a discussion on this and make this decision that's really the goal of it so you know putting together a, a governance committee that has your your it heads your security heads and some representation from the business as well just off, at, at, a, at a minimum is a really great way to uh, get a regular cadence on the calendar maybe like once a month or something to have these discussions and you know, IT can raise. What's the what's the pushback on implementing external sharing? And then you can get that back and forth from your security team in terms of, well, this is what we're concerned about, and these are the different options that we have. How do we want to go forward? Awesome. Very, very good point. That's great. So, so guys, uh, just a few minutes on this next topic, and we want to make sure we can uh, wrap up and uh, and get everyone back to their day. But Tim, you mentioned it a little earlier in our conversation here. How do you standardize process across multiple departments, right? You mentioned not wanting to have, you know, a template for everyone, but mm -hmm. how do we go about that? And where, you know, where should we start? I, I think everyone is familiar with that department level collaboration. 
Sure. And and like I mentioned before, I, what we recommend is to start small and then build out from there and start with the lowest common denominator. So what I mean by that is when you think about department from a, from an information management sense, it's really just metadata. You know, whether this team belongs to HR or this team belongs to finance, you know, the team itself is is less important, but you're, you're tagging it as a certain thing. And then what policies come along with that as well? So, you know, from a central IT as a service, as a service provider, if we think about standardizing the process, uh, I would start with one single department as an example. And what what's the core makeup of what defines who can ask for a department template and uh, you know what happens with it afterwards? And from there, you can then start branching it out and say, oh, well, actually, HR is a little bit different. Only HR can request HR sites. And actually, you know, with a finance site, once something's tagged as belonging to finance, we don't want external users in there. So once you've uh, determined what that core template looks like and that core process, then the different types of uh, departmental tags really just become part of your process. Yep. Agreed. And, and again, Charlie, the way we approach that is uh, with business workshops, right? Yep. And it's, again, it's not rocket science. It's not the technical. The technical is the easy part, right? It's You'd be surprised how much value you can bring to the table if you can simply identify four channels that every department needs or should have. And a, and a OneNote notebook should live in the team and it should have these sections in it. And whatever, a planner or, or some te default template file. The value that that brings to a department in department-based collaboration is huge. And, and people can then say, hey, it's in the such and such team in the, you know, in the presentations folder. And everybody knows what you mean. That's a big, yeah. big, huge value. Um, sharing files back and forth, it, it will literally eliminate email attachments in your organization. And that's a massive win alone, right? Um, so those those simple things make a huge difference. And then it's it's being able to enforce those simple things that you can define to people that that really make, you know, that's really where the rubber hits the road. Yeah. Awesome. Well, guys, this has been uh, a great conversation. I, I know I've learned a lot and I've enjoyed it. And uh, thank you both to uh, Steve and Tim for your time. Absolutely. And and we just want to kind of wrap this up with a few key takeaways and then, you know, how uh, how AppPoint and IntelliNet can help you on this journey that you guys are uh, are about to undertake. So in summarizing our conversation here of the last 45 minutes, let's make sure you have a plan, right? This is, uh, this is not time to uh, go willy-nilly, right? We want to have a plan. We want to hold ourselves accountable to it and we want to move forward. You know, Tim said it a few times and I really appreciate that. Let's start small. Let's get wins. Let's get iteratively build upon that, and we'll go from there, right? Let's not start with, as Steve said, the 80-page governance uh, document that no one's going to read and is going to be shelfware. Let's uh, let's start small and work our way to it, right? Let's make sure that we can automate the life cycle, right? There's a lot of things we can do to make this easier for users, and we want to make sure that we are doing that and focused on that. And by that, we can also segment who has access to different templates, as these guys talked about. And, uh, and we can kind of keep that focus of what templates they, uh, our particular users need. Also, and this is important with anything, and I'm sure you get, everyone here uh, understands this, let's identify the use cases that we need that we're trying to solve the problem for, and then let's get those templates in, in place. And with anything nowadays, we need to have that kind of that, uh, that triple threat of uh, alliance, where we are aligning business, the IT, and our security uh, objectives, right? That can be the baseline of your governance committee. We need everyone to come together. We need to solve these business problems pragmatically, and then we can, uh, we can have a lot of success from there. So, so what's next? You know, we, uh, one, thank you all for taking time out of your day. Again, thank you to Tim and Steve for, uh, for their expertise and their insights from, from what others are doing. But um, we are offering a virtual whiteboard uh, as, as a follow-up to this. It's a 60-minute session where we'll walk through and discuss some of the challenges and needs that could be specific to your organization, right? We can uh, provide a, the current state and what your future state should be get the beginnings of that roadmap so that you guys can start to start to check off uh, steps in that journey. What are the best practices? And then really start to show you some of the art of the possible, 
right? It's hard to understand what the journey should be if you don't know what that art of the possible can be so that you know where the boundaries are that you can and should stay within, right? Um, there, we're also uh, offering a, a trial license of AppPoint's uh, policy and insights or cloud governance tools. So those are, uh, that can be part of that workshop as well. So um, that's all I have. I want to thank you all again. And uh, Sage, I'll turn this back uh, to you. Thank you, Charlie. And thank you, everybody, for joining us today. Please find a copy of today's slide deck now available via the Files button at the bottom left of your screen. As a reminder, you can access the event recording at the same location you joined today's event. Lastly, your feedback is important, so please take a few minutes to let us know how we did by completing a short survey that will appear in your browser window shortly after the stream ends. I'd like to extend a thank you to all of our presenters. This concludes today's event. You may now disconnect.